Thanks, David. I'm so happy to be here today and to talk to this phenomenal panel. Dr. Kelly Monahan is a social scientist and studies the future workforce at Accenture Research. Her writing has been recognized and published and applied in academic journals. Catherine Minshew is founder and CEO of The Muse, a career platform used by more than 75 million people. She's also the author of The New Rules of Work and hosts a podcast by the same name. Ian Siegel is co-founder and CEO of Zip Recruiter, a leading online employment marketplace whose platform actively connects millions of business to job seekers across all industries. Thank you all for being with us to offer your thoughts on reimagining your resume and evolving your skills. Kelly, I'd like to start with you just to set the scene for us. What are you seeing in the data about how the workforce is feeling these days and what job seekers could be focusing on? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. What a great question. You know, within the data, let's take a quick step back and realize that COVID-19 has put people in a state of shock. It has disrupted all of our work lives to different degrees. Within the data set at Accenture Research, we're going out into market every other week to collect data on people just like you and I to determine how people feel about these shocks and the ripple down effect. We have found three unique experiences that are influencing the way people feel, and I hope you can identify yourself in one of these. The very first is the disrupted and displaced worker. Let's be honest, as of March, 22 million jobs in the US have been lost. The labor report just came out today, uh, noting August, 8.4% unemployment rates. So it might be no surprise that we see within this workforce financial needs at the forefront. About 62% of global workers within our data set are reporting high levels of job insecurity. And so we've got very basic needs and feelings emerging at this level. The second experience that's causing people to shift the way they feel is that of the underemployed worker. What does underemployment mean? That means that people don't feel that they're using their skills, strengths, and capabilities each day. Now, before COVID, this was a third of all people. Today, that number has jumped to well over a third, closer to 40%. And so, be, again, no surprise, we're seeing workers in this persona. 52% today are worried this shock, all this distraction we have for COVID-19 is only going to exasperate this problem. And this is causing great emotional and mental needs. And our third group, which is probably many of us sitting on this panel today, are the remote worker. 57% of people have been caused to work from offices now into their homes, and they have no experience doing so. And I think one of the most alarming things we're seeing in this data that's been very consistent since COVID-19 has hit is that 76% of people are reporting high loneliness. And so we see relational needs and feelings coming to the forefront as people are seeking to learn how to work in this what we call it Accenture Never Normal, and especially understand how do we connect with people through these technologies. So depending on your experience, the needs vary, but there's one thing that I'm looking forward to discussing in this panel today, is that no matter what your workforce experience is, whether you've been disrupted, displaced, whether you're now remote, here's the bottom line, we've all got to focus on upskilling and new skilling and figure out what are those skills that are going to get you the foot in the door. Thanks, Kelly. That's super interesting. Catherine, have the user behaviors at the Muse changed these past few months? What are you seeing? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's been really interesting to watch the impact of COVID on how people are both looking for jobs and job search and also looking for content and advice on the Muse. So in the first category, um, probably surprising to no one, but uh, remote and flexible jobs have increased massively. We are seeing across every geography, every industry, um, a huge surge of people who are looking for jobs that can either fully or partially be done from home. Um, the, the sort of recession and the various economic impacts of COVID have also hit different sectors and different industries unevenly. So we've seen an increase um, in people looking for jobs in companies that deal with technology, um, infrastructure in some cases, healthcare, education, and then other sectors such as obviously travel and hospitality have been very, very hard to hit. And both the number of people looking for jobs as well as the types of jobs they're looking for um, is way down across almost every category. On the content side, it's been interesting. Um, again, we've seen almost a, I think, 20x increase in people looking for advice and content on the Muse about remote work, remote interviewing, um, you know, how do you stand out in a digital world? Because it is really different, right? You can't just show up face to face at a career fair or a recruiting event and expect to have the same sort of interactions. We're all now doing everything over these virtual platforms. And so we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of people who are coming to the Muse 
obviously looking for jobs, but also looking for that guidance and looking for that advice. Um, and then the last thing I would say that um, I'm really passionate about and have been very, very pleased to see in the data is that we've seen a, um, a, a really significant increase in the uh, numbers of people looking for content on um, how to assess if the workplace they're thinking about joining is an inclusive one. So content around uh, diversity, around building belonging and equity um, into the teams. How do you assess for this type of thing in the job search? Um, we're seeing a lot of interest in that in light of many of the broader national conversations around how do we create workplaces that work for all of us? Because you know, I think COVID has laid bare so many of the challenges um, and difficulties that different populations of Americans face on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're seeing in a really interesting way, in a way I think sets us up um, hopefully powerfully to build a better, a better future, we're seeing both individual employees and companies start to really think about how to, yeah, how to build a better workplace and how to make that workplace work better for different populations of employees. Absolutely. That sounds like a true reflection of, of, of where we are as a country today. That's really great to level set on where people are emotionally. I bet a lot of our viewers can relate to that. So let's talk about specifics. Ian, is there something that a job seeker can do on their resume to stand out from all other applicants? All right. Pay attention because I'm about to give you the most important piece of information you need if you are in the process of looking for work. 70% of resumes that are submitted for an application to a job are read by a robot before they are read by a human. At this point, the only purpose your resume serves is to pass that robot filter to get to the human. So what do you gotta do in your resume in order to get there? Number one, you gotta use the most boring template possible. I mean, I want you to go to Google Docs or Microsoft Word, use the generic resume template they have there where it clearly lists your title, the years of experience you have, and then somewhere on that resume, I want you to list the skills you have and your level of expertise with those skills. There are parsers trying to extract that information to put it in front of humans so that they decide which are gonna be the final list of vetted down candidates that they're gonna bring in for interviews. If you wanna stand out, what you actually have to do right now is simplify make sure the robots can read your resume. That's great advice. So simplify in order to stand out. That's excellent. Some people are looking for their first job. Some want to take their career in a different direction. Some may be re-entering the workforce because of a change in circumstances with their loved ones. In my case, I worked for 13 years full-time and made a choice to become a stay-at-home mom to my three children. And when it came time to go back to work, I had a really, really tough time. I felt like I had to learn a whole new skill set. How would you counsel people who are trying to get a foot in the door, Ian? Well, first off, there's really two different buckets people fall into. One is they left the workforce for some reason, usually personal, often family related. And in those cases, the thing you got to remember is that's not an uncommon story. Employers are encountering that every time they post a job, so you should just be open and explain the choice you made and that you're ready to get back in. That is a common narrative. What's happening today, however, is that more than 20 million people lost their job as a result of COVID. And now a lot of them have to face the question of why were you expendable? I only have one piece of advice for you if you actually get to the interview stage and you get asked this question. Never bash either your former employer or your former boss. The only thing I want you to talk about is what you learned from the experience and how you're going to improve going forward to make sure that you're never expendable again. Catherine, are you finding that similarly? I, I could not agree more with what Ian said. Um, so I just want to plus one that. It is a huge red flag for a lot of employers when a candidate speaks poorly of, uh, of companies in the past because it makes them worry, would they do the same for me? Um, the other two pieces of advice I would give, one is that, um, and, and I think this has come out in a lot of what, uh, what the other panelists have said, 
but um, many employers are looking for resilience and looking for a learning mindset among the candidates that they're hiring. And it makes sense, right? The entire world is different now than we thought it would be six, 12 months ago. And so candidates that can show that they are able to learn and grow and that they have a track record of resiliency, um, I think are, are doing better by and large than candidates that don't. And that's, a, that's actually great news, I think, because there's so many different opportunities when you think about your own life to think about a time when you've been resilient, when you've learned and adjusted quickly. Um, and so I would absolutely encourage people to think about that either in a cover letter, if you're writing one, in a uh, job interview, et cetera. Um, and then the last thing I would say, and this harkens back a little bit to Ian's point earlier about making sure that your resume is very clear and very direct and very simple, is that it's really helpful to include the same words in your resume and your application as you see in the job description. So a very simple tip that we often recommend on The Muse is to actually print out a job description that you're thinking of applying for and use a highlighter to highlight what are some of the most common words, skills that the employer says they want. And then think about, well, obviously may, you know, being truthful and being authentic to your experience, but is there a way that you um, can use those same skills? Don't use a synonym. Sometimes it's helpful to literally just use the same word if it's one that um, that your that your application you know is is uh, is justified with, and that can help again both a human and um, an applicant tracking system say okay we're looking for these things and the candidate has them. Wonderful, thank you, Kelly. Any research insights on getting getting your foot in the door? Yeah, you know, as a social scientist, I'm going to come from this probably with a bit of a different angle, but something that Ian and Catherine have both hit on, which I think is absolutely instrumental these days, is that growth mindset. And that's the one thing you can control. As Ian mentioned, you know, there's a lot of things outside of your control as you go to submit that resume. But what's within your control is making sure that you use every opportunity, regardless of the outcome, to actually learn from that experience. You know, if your resume did not get picked up or you didn't get through the interviews, what did you do differently? What can you learn from this experience? And again, going back to something I mentioned earlier, what does it take to build this growth mindset, especially to build this resiliency muscle during this shock environment? And what we know from research we're going to be releasing soon is that when your needs are under stress and under shock, your physical, mental, emotional, relational, it's hard to show up each day with that mindset. So I'd like to give everyone the advice to make sure that you're putting on your own oxygen mask first, taking care of your own core needs. That's going to allow you to show up when you get, you get that foot in the door, truly your authentic self and being able to show them that adaptability, resiliency. And so that's where I would add to that conversation. It's a particularly difficult time to change fields because so many of these resumes are reading your past experience. Sorry, so many of these resumes are being read by software that's extracting your past experience. And if your experience doesn't match what the job description says, per what Catherine said, they're not even going to show you to whoever the hiring manager is. So this is a time where it behooves you, if you want to change careers and move into a new field, to try and find either a certification or a license that you can go get that provides validation that you have the skills to do this job, even if you don't have the past work experience to do this job. And honestly, it's an extraordinary time for single skill jobs. We call these new collar jobs, and there is a raft of them that have emerged in the market that provide middle-class lifestyles with very little training required, whether it's flying a drone, uh, learning a software like Pro Tools to support the 500,000 people who are trying to make a living as a podcaster, or even learning something like AutoCAD, which is a little bit more advanced, but then it opens you up to every field of architecture and engineering. So there's a surprising number of jobs that require mastery of a single software or uh, acquiring a single license or certification. You should definitely think about getting that evidence if you're trying to change careers right now. Ian, there are many people job seeking now that have gaps, whether it was by choice, as mine was to stay at home with my kids or not. What is the best advice you have for explaining gaps? The important thing to understand about gaps is a lot of people have gaps. And so as long as you have the skills listed in your resume and prior work experience, that should be enough to actually get you to the interview. Where you really have to confront the gap question is when you're in the interview itself and the interviewer asks you, why do you have this gap? The number one piece of advice I have is be honest. Be direct, and, do, and most importantly, you don't have to apologize for a gap. A lot of people have gaps in their work history. It's actually an opportunity to show more of who you are 
and to give them insight into things that are the soft skills that you will bring to the job. Because most often gaps have to, have to do with either making a choice to stay home with family or pursuing a passion project for some period of time. So it sounds like sometimes sharing your story can be powerful and can make you more attractive to an employer. So let's talk about how you get the job you want during COVID. Catherine, are there any specific insights on, on narrowing that down? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'd say, as uh, Kelly mentioned earlier, that um, you've got to put your oxygen mask on first, which in this case I would say means it is a marathon, not a sprint. Know that you're going to have days that are great, full of triumph, and days that are incredibly challenging where it doesn't feel like you're making progress. And that is part of the process. It is normal. It is okay. Once you're in the thick of the job search, first of all, I always say it's quality over quantity. What do I mean by that? Sometimes people think that succeeding in the job search is just about blasting out their application to as many places as possible. And in some cases that can help, but in general, especially if you're looking for work that requires skills, where you need to really demonstrate why you're the best candidate over a lot of other candidates, it's more impactful to pick a, um, a smaller number of opportunities, but really tailor your materials. So again, look at what skills does this role require? What are the things that the job description is asking for, and then how can I make sure that my application materials demonstrate that I have those skills? And again, I would say when you do get that chance to interview, um, do your homework, right? It is often very intimidating for people to interview. I understand that. It can be intimidating for me too, but um, sometimes people react by not preparing for the interview um, and just kind of winging it. Um, what I always recommend is, first of all, research the company. What is the culture and the work environment like? What are the values of the company? What sorts of things might they be looking for in an employee? And then again, think about some of the most common interview questions. Um, you can do a Google, Google search for common interview questions. The Muse has a lot of advice. There's a lot of different places to get insight, but you can start to think about what might you get asked, how might you want to respond? And it's not about coming in with a canned answer. I think interviewers do want to feel like you're having a, a genuine back and forth conversation. But if you do that prep work and you know why you're a good fit, um, that goes a really, really long way. And that leads to my very last point, which is sometimes um, when people are applying for jobs, they focus very much on why I want this job or why I need this job. But I have found, and our, our data on the news shows as well, that um, most employers would prefer for candidates to focus on what they can bring to the company. So why are you the right person for the role versus why do you do you need or do you want the job? Um, and that applies to your resume and cover letter. It applies to the interview. It applies all the way through the process. Kelly, what does your research tell you about people trying to switch industries? Where are the jobs going? What can people focus on for reskilling or upskilling themselves? Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting time we're in. You know, we know from decades of research that social skills actually tend to be some of the most transferable skills going into different industries. So whether that's communication, interpersonal skills, those tend to be pretty industry agnostic. But the key question that we're trying to address through research today is what's that premium that you can get when you try to transfer, transfer to a different job or industry? And we're finding time and time again, you need to have those digital skills. Digital skills really unlock, unlock the pathway towards greater economic opportunity, better jobs. And so when you're able to have the social plus digital skill set, you're going to have a, a pathway to many different industries. A couple industries that we're seeing right now actually flourish and thrive during these COVID times is right off the bat, education and healthcare. And typically you might not think of those as necessarily high tech industries, but think about what's been happening. Teachers now have had to be enabled along to work alongside technologies. Healthcare options have had to move very quickly into digital solutions. And so if you have a skill set that allows you to service people in a way that robots or technology never can, at least for our, our, our lifetime or the foreseeable future, and then you also have that digital skill though that really elevates you in your work, that we see is really unlocking uh, brand new pathways. And so I think it's a really exciting time to, to double down, to be honest with you, on both the social, but really the digital. And just to give you something practical, what we're finding in our research that we're going to be releasing later in this year, what digital skills are most in demand and, and what are actually uh, workforce most fluent in, as we say, we found these three skill sets. The first, we're seeing cloud computing rise as one of the most in demand skill sets and one of the biggest skills gaps within the workforce. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here. The second one is really around robotic process automation, being able to use automated technologies in such a way that makes uh, organizations much more efficient. 
And the third thing, which is not quite a technology, but we're seeing statistical analysis. So really being able to use statistics to help machines learn and um, artificial intelligence are three key areas that we're seeing a lot of opportunity and growth within our research. I love, Kelly, what you said about this focus on digital. And I also just want to remind people that there's one very, very, very simple and basic digital skill, which anyone who's interviewing right now may want to think about brushing up on. And that is literally um, using video technology to interview or speak with employers. You would be surprised how many people are not comfortable yet loading up a video, uh, positioning themselves in the frame, knowing where to speak if they're talking with somebody about a potential role. And that can, in some cases, actually be the difference between an employer feeling like you would be able to seamlessly join their team and adapt to digital work, or that it might be another struggle or another obstacle. So again, I would definitely encourage people, in addition to some of these more um, kind of high value professional skills, to just practice, get very comfortable with any technology that you might be using in the process of interviewing, job searching, anytime you're going to be interacting with a company, because the small things can make a big difference in, um, in those first impressions. Research has been done multiple times that shows people giving interviews make determinations about the interviewee in less than one second. And so the awesome thing about video interviewing is you have 100% control over that first second. You decide what they see. You decide whether you're smiling. You decide whether your bed is made, whether your room is clean. You get to make a lot of choices to advantage you in getting off to a positive start you definitely don't want the first impression to be one of you struggling to get the video technology to work. This is particularly true for people who are 50 plus, who are finding it difficult during this COVID period to successfully interview. And there is a lot of struggle in that population to find work right now. You can't use it as an excuse. I totally agree with Catherine. If you're gonna master one new skill, and it's a digital skill, it's got to be using your camera phone or the, the camera on your computer. Ian, going back to what you just said, uh, first impressions, first few seconds, what's the most important thing you believe that employers catch on to or zone into as soon as they see a candidate? Well, there's a bunch of uh, soft signals or cues that we give off based on how prepared we look. So how are we dressed? How, what does our hair look like? Are we leaning forward? Are we leaning back? These are the soft cues. But a lot of job seekers actually struggle with anxiety and they get into the interview and they just feel like the thing they're supposed to do is talk about themselves, talk about themselves. And in a way, they end up boring their interviewer and missing the whole point of the interview because to what Catherine said earlier, this isn't about you, it's about how you fit into that organization. So I have a hack for job seekers who are nervous about interviewing. I'm gonna give you your magical first sentence that's gonna get you off to a great start in any interview you do. And no matter how corny or cheesy this sounds, I strongly encourage you to do it because you would be amazed at what leading with positivity will do with the rest of the interview. The sentence I want you to use is this. I'm so excited to be here because fill in the blank. And here's the thing, you gotta do your research to fill in the blank. And by doing that research, you're gonna be so much better prepared for this interview. I'm so excited to be here because I've been a user of your product for years and I can't believe I might have the opportunity to work on it. I'm so excited to be here because I've heard about your company culture by reading about it on Glassdoor or talking to friends who work at the company and I definitely could see myself being a part of it. That's the kind of culture that I wanna be in. You immediately not only express interest and 50% of attraction is you going first and expressing interest. But the other thing you do is you start a conversation about them. It is a natural reaction for that interviewer to yes and whatever you said. You like our product? Yes, we love our product. Our product wins awards. Now you're talking about their product. That is a great place to be in any interview. Yeah, passion for the job, passion for the company, and passion for what you can bring to the company. It's been so great talking with all of you all today. I'm sure our Career Day audience is walking away with some great ideas on how to adapt their resume and skills these days. I wanna thank our panel for joining us today and I'll send it back to you, David.